Welcome to On The Fly. I'm Gene DiFilippo, your host, and our guest again this week is Bill Polian, the six-time NFL Executive of the Year. Bill has been to many Super Bowls and NFL championship games, NFC championship games, and he's going to tell us a little bit about that uh, right now. What are the what's the exact record, Bill? Well, uh, with the Bills, we went to four straight Super Bowls. I left uh, uh, before the fourth, but uh, that was largely the team that we had built. So while it doesn't appear on my record, I it, it, I like to take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> As well, you should. <laughs> and then. Uh, went to Carolina and and started up an expansion team. And in the second year, we made it to the uh, NFC championship game. That had never been done before. And interestingly enough, a guy that you know real well, Tom Coughlin, did the same thing in the same year uh, with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Neither of, our, neither of us made it to the Super Bowl, uh, but going to the championship game was an incredible feat. Um, and then in Indianapolis, we went to two Super Bowls winning uh, Super Bowl 41. So I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm one shy of the record for losing Super Bowls, but uh, overall five Super Bowls, depending on what you count in Buffalo, five or six Super Bowls and eight conference championship games in 24 years as a GM. Pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. You know, one thing you've taught me is it is really hard to win in the National Football League. It is really hard, and you've won everywhere you've been, so congratulations. Bill, today we're going to talk about the Combine. We're a couple of weeks away from the, the NFL Combine, and so many of our listeners out there have heard about the Combine, but very few of them know what it is. Tell us what the Combine is. Well, I'm glad you asked, because... There's lots of baloney out there about what goes on at the combine and what it actually is and why it's there. And it's it's great to have the opportunity to take the record, to set the record straight. Let's go back in history to 1980. At that point, uh, clubs had figured out that with the amount of money that was being paid to rookies, with the advent of the USFL, and that was going to raise the pay scale even more, that they wanted to know more about the players, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. And if you went around the country trying to use your scouting staff and even your coaching staff to test 200 or so players, even though there are 300 and 56 players, odd players drafted. Now, you can't look at all 356, and realistically, they're not on your draft board anyway. Um, so the number is about 200. But to try and work out 200 guys between, let's say, uh, February 1st and, and March 15th, which is generally when the combine starts, is a physical impossibility much less giving them physicals. So the two scouting combines there, in those days there were two scouting combines, Blesto and Sipo. Blesto stood for Bears, Lions, Eagles, Steelers, talent organization. Now there were more teams than, than just those in Blesto. Sipo had the same basic alignment. The heads of those two combines got together. They're combines of teams looking to seek out talent. That's where the name comes from. Uh, they got together. First of all, they started their own. Sipo had one in Seattle. Blesto had one, I believe, in Detroit. And you could do that, obviously, indoor facilities, decent weather in Seattle, et cetera. And then after two years, they said, why don't we do this together? Why don't we combine this, put together the drills, put together the physical exams, et cetera, put together a steering committee of general managers who will run this 
and uh, and plan it, and and we'll save everybody a lot of money. And the impetus for the combining of the two workout groups really came from the college coaches, because in those days, the players did not leave college the way they do now, and uh, and go right to combine training even before the bowl games are over. That's what happens now. Guys leave after the last game and and not the bowl game, but the last regular season game, unless it's a, a playoff game, and and go and begin training. In those days, they did not. And the co- coaches wanted them on campus and in class so that they could graduate because graduation rates, even in those days, were a, a pretty big deal. So. Everybody got together, American Football Coaches Association, of which you and I were members at one time in another life. (laughs) In another life, right. (laughs) And and, and their leadership and the leadership of the NFL Competition Committee, and they put together this idea of one combine that would take place over four days, over a weekend in March, generally fitting into kind of the spring break period of time. That was the original idea. And, uh, and and the players would only be away two days from school, or three days, I'm sorry, one for travel and then and, and two for the for the workouts. So the first combine, I believe was the one that I attended in Tempe, Arizona, which was 1984. And we all looked forward to going to Tempe, hope knowing that the weather would be gorgeous. It was 42 degrees and freezing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the last combine ever held outdoors. The following year, they went to New Orleans. And we stayed there for a couple of years. And then the New Orleans Superdome had, Superdome had too many events in it. They didn't want it, believe it or not. And so it ended up in Indianapolis, where it's been ever since. And uh, and so now, because players graduate actually at the end, most graduate if they're going to graduate in December of their senior years. As I said before, at the end of the season, they're off to their training facilities in Phoenix or in Tampa or wherever they train with whomever they train, getting ready for the combine and the pro days that are held concomitantly on the on campuses around the country. And we've even consolidated the pro days so that, for example, um, in it, it, uh, kids from Harvard, Tufts, UMass, UConn are allowed to come to BC's Pro Day and work out so that the, the clubs make one stop in the geographic area. They get to see everybody who's there, et cetera. Uh, you raised the question of how are these guys invited? They are invited by a committee of general managers and personnel directors who use their scouting reports to try and put together a representative list of about 250 guys who are invited. And that list is a compilation uh, that that committee casts a wide net. It's about eight to nine GMs and scouting directors. And and they pretty much covered the the NFL. Um, So it's a good list. The, The combine doesn't miss many people. There are always seventh rounders and sixth rounders who are not invited to the combine who make teams. You can't be perfect, but what, but, but they really do a good job. The original purpose of the combine as enunciated by George Young, Hall of Fame general manager of the New York Giants was to get a universal physical and consistent physical exam for every player. George often said, if it stopped right there, we're fine. We can always get the workouts. We can always get the measurables. We can always do the psychological testing on our own if we have to. 
the physicals are number one. And Indianapolis, I'll, 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 I'll give a little pitch for uh, the city that I worked in for 14 years. Indianapolis, when we built Lucas Oil Stadium, we specifically set aside tremendous back of the house space to house virtually everything to do with the physical exams and, except very esoteric scans. So if a player needs an MRI, it's done right in Lucas Oil Stadium. If he needs an X-ray, it's done right in Lucas Oil Stadium. So the college coaches are thrilled with the idea that these kids come in, they're there for three days, and they go home. Even if they're not on campus, they're not losing a lot of time. And 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 the physical exam is the most thorough. I can say this without hyperbole. The physical exam is the most thorough they will undergo in their lives. It's now, Bill, who who gives this exam? Who chooses the doctors to be sure that they're they're you know competent that they're they're not for one team or another? Or how, how are the doctors chosen? It's it's uh, each uh, medical staff in the NFL. Thirty two of them contribute four doctors essentially: an internist, a cardiologist, an orthopedic surgeon, and then a general team physician. And they, in in order to ensure no skullduggery and 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 complete and and upfront transparency, they're grouped in pods. Uh, I believe there are eight pods. And the players are assigned at random. So the doctors never know who they're getting until they actually get the guy's chart. Well, you saw so, everything, haven't you? Yeah, yes, yes. I was on the competition committee for 20 years, and 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 we did cover every base to make sure that it was as as neutral, as transparent, because we followed George's dictum, which was let's make the let's make this about the physical exams first last and always all the rest of it, it, it i don't want to say is folder all but it's second by a wide 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 margin to the physical exams and every year every year there is at least one and sometimes as many as three players who are found to have a condition that disqualifies them from playing football and in many cases, if it were not uh, uh, diagnosed and treated, the player might die in the course of his normal existence, much less football. This is the most thorough physical they will ever take, save perhaps for guys who become Navy pilots or astronauts. This, this is far more encompassing than the military service physicals. It's far more encompassing than, than anything in the civilian world. So um, it's a good thing, and it's it's the reason for the combine. Um, Bill, let me ask you a question. Yeah. How do you, how do you get 250 players through? Do you stagger them? The yes. The quarterbacks yeah, come, come one day, the in, offensive yeah. linemen another day. Is that yeah, how you that's do That's exactly it? right. Yeah, they come in by position group. And, uh, and it, you know, wherever they start, they start. They're changing the, the, the rotation this year for television. But uh, uh, they come in by position group, and, they're, and they stay with that position group. They have club scouts who are assigned to shepherd them around, and they stay with that position group throughout the entire week. It is, or four days, I should say. It is, a, it is a hectic period of time, and the competition committee is working with the clubs to eliminate a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, unnecessary stuff that they have to do that takes up a lot of time. The most unnecessary is meeting with the media, but the league is not going to let that go. By the way, there's a myth that the league office runs the they runs the combine. They don't. They don't. They 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 try to have a loud voice in what goes on, but they don't run it. It's the clubs who run. The clubs run it. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so you, we understand you stagger the players and they're in groups and they stay in those groups. 
Now, what? who devises the exercises that they're going to do either, you know, uh, a broad jump, a high jump, a 40-yard dash? Are, are there different tests for different groups, or does everybody do the same thing? Uh, there's two types of testing. The first is what I would call universal measurable testing. That's the same for everyone, and it consists of the following. Height, weight, that's measured by one per, by one group of people. Everybody's measured by the same group, so there's no variance. Every position group. Then speed, the 40-yard dash, is universal. Everyone does that. And that's measured both by hand, by, by scouts and senior scouting executives, and electronically. So you get two, you get two times, the hand time and the electronic time. So uh, the, that, that's, uh, that is uh, uh, that part of it. That's the universal part, universal part of it. Um, and then there are individual drills. Uh, let me back up. I'm sorry. Included in that that universal part are a uh, vertical jump. Everybody does that. A uh, a uh, long jump. Everybody does that. And a forty yard and twenty yard shuttle drill, which is a lateral movement drill. Everybody does that. And a three cone drill. Uh, which is a, a which is a really good measurement of lateral movement, speed, change of direction. Everyone does that. So all of those numbers come to the clubs. And so, for example, we would have with the Colts, we have what was called a scorecard. We listed the players by position on the left hand side of the page. On the right hand side was height, weight, forty speed. 10 time, which is taken as a, is extrapolated from the 40. Uh, 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 a long jump, et, et, et cetera. All those universal now, tests. Bill, let me ask you one other question. I hear sometimes about some guys pressing 200 pounds or 225 pounds so many times. Is it just for linemen or is that for everybody too? No, everybody does it. Uh, it, it, we found now each club has their own drill measurements, by the way, which uh, 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 on which they place value. We would do a regression study every year as to what drills were important to us and correlated to players making it in the NFL with us. We found zero correlation between the bench press and making it in the NFL. There are other teams that believe in it. That's fine. We didn't care about it. We sent one scout there just to, just to, to write it down. It be, it's gotten a lot of notoriety because they showed it on television, and the strength coaches got all excited, and everybody began to foam at the mouth, and you know, you know what weightlifting's like, yelling and screaming and carrying on. So fans watched it on television and thought it is important. In our minds, it, with the Colts, it was not important at all. Uh, if you if you can't lift if you're an offensive lineman and you can't lift more than 15 times with 225 pounds you haven't been working out that's all <laughs> you know there's no difference between 18 lifts and 25 lifts none none whatsoever okay Good. so thank uh, you for explaining it, that it's just a sideshow uh, the important drills for us I'll speak for the Colts were uh, 40 and 10 time for us was not did not correlate there are other teams that believe 10 time for both receivers and dbs and 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 offensive linemen and defensive linemen correlate they did not for us we found no correlation um that's not to say it's not there we just you know we didn't find it um and and then all the other drills of all the other drills the, the for the linemen, the twenty yard shuttle was this positive, and for everybody else, the three cone was 
completely, totally dispositive. Just, I mean, almost a hundred, nothing's a hundred percent, but 90% accurate in terms of who could play and who couldn't play. Really? So we, yeah. So that was more than the bench press, more than anything. Way more. Three cone drill. Yeah. Yeah. For non line For non line For non line right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And it's even dispositive for outside, for edge rushers. Okay. Believe it or not, the 40 is also dispositive for offensive linemen. If you're uh, if you're five one or above, it's pretty hard to play at a high level in the NFL these days. And we all have norms. We all, you know, I'm using these times. We all have norms that that we use based on the system of football that we play. So, for example, with the Colts, we had Peyton Manning, we had Marvin Harrison. We played in the in the dome, we played in a division that where we, we knew we were going to play 10 games a year in the virtually perfect weather. Um, and, and so that means you're usually correlating to about 12 out of the, in those days, 16 in perfect weather. So we were a speed team. So if you were more than four, five, one, Reggie Wayne, who please God will be in the Hall of Fame next year um, and deserve, should have been in a year ago. Uh, ran four five one and we said mm, we don't know about that he might not be fast enough <laughs> well he turned out to be fast enough yes but, he but sure did if you were five four or five, four five or above we we worried about it it was a red what so-called red number for us it showed up red on the scorecard so um that's what th those are the universal drills then they have individual drills by position which uh, it didn't change for a long period of time. As the game changed, those drills didn't change. And so now uh, there is a special committee, again, of club people, not NFL office people. There might be three people in the NFL office that know what the combine actually is about. Uh, the the uh, So there, there are uh, – the, the clubs have a committee that's trying to revamp the drills to make them more uh, applicable to today's game, which is a, a 53 and a third yard passing game, right. largely. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what those drills are when we, uh, you know, when they get together in, in February. Bill, everybody's interested in the quarterbacks. Well, you know, what the quarterbacks do. I mean, there's very little interest in the offensive linemen because we don't know who they are most of the time, but the quarterbacks, what kind of drills and who would run the drills that the quarterbacks would go through? Well, the quarterbacks go through drills individually, and then they do it with the receivers. Um, by the way, every year someone calls me and says, could you get the league to allow DBs to cover receivers in the drills? And my answer is never in a million years because you can't get insurance for that. <laughs> uh -oh. hadn't thought about that right that's right so unless someone's willing to come up with the insurance premium and it sure isn't going to be the indianapolis colts when i was there <laughs> and i think i speak for virtually every other general manager you're not going to see competitive one-on-ones at the at the combine um as much as television wants it now if television is willing to put the uh, foot the bill and the agents are willing to let the players do it, which is a big, big question. If they won't play in bowl games, why would they go one-on-one -on -one at the combine? Right. Right? Right. That makes sense. Having, having said that, uh, the quarterbacks are put through the drills by quarterback coaches, period. Guys, there are 32 quarterback coaches. There's probably 18 of them involved in, the, in any given year in the combine drills. The same with the receiver coaches. And then they combine to put together the routes that are run that the quarterbacks throw. So they're and, trying to make sure that quarterback can make every throw. Is what exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. You want to make sure that the quarterback can make every throw. So they make the 17-yard out from the far hash which really covers 29 yards or 30 yards when you when, when you drive it. 
they 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 take three step drops they take five step drops they take seven step drops now they now they roll out and 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 bootleg and throw off uh you know different platforms so it, it all replicates what they do on the field television would like them to do other stuff but the clubs resist that because what we're trying to do is find football players uh, the television w- wants to put on a show and frankly they butt heads uh every year on that okay you've been over um the medical um you've been over how they're in groups each group has some tests that they're going to be the same but they have others um that are uh, that are uh, position specific. Now we've all heard about this Wonderlick test. I I have no idea. I was in college athletics for forty years. I have no idea what is the Wonderlick test is about. Is it football knowledge? Is it basic knowledge? What is it, Bill? It has nothing to do with football. It's it's basically, for lack of a better term. An IQ test. Okay. It's 50 questions. There is a time limit. I believe it's uh, it's a half hour. Uh, and it has taken on a life of its own. It's been mythologized by people who don't understand how it's used. If we come across a player with a learning disability based on the Wonderlic, first thing we do is send them back to our individual learning specialist and psychologist and have them retested. All it is, is a barometer. It picks up red flags, i.e. reading, comprehension, speed of processing. It, it's a gross uh, test that acts as a, a not, not even a benchmark. It's a diagnostic tool, gross diagnostic tool, which we then use to follow up with people. It doesn't disqualify anybody. There's a myth that it disqualifies people. It does not. It tells you in a common sense way, listen, this guy has learning difficulties. Let's find out why. For uh, I'll get, it, it, Bruce Smith was fine on it, by the way, but let, let me use him as an example because it's a it, it's such a, gl- a glaring example. Bruce Smith is and 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 Reggie White are the two greatest defensive ends of all time. Let's just say that Bruce had did poorly on the Wonderland, right? He didn't, but let's just assume for a moment that he did. At that point, knowing that he was the best defensive lineman to come along in years. In, 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 in coming out of college, we would have said, okay, let's have to refer him to the learning specialist. Let's refer him to the psychologist. We were one of the first in Buffalo, by the way, to employ a psychologist. And then let's find, let's diagnose him and find out w- w- what the difficulty is here. And let's find a way to fix it. So, for example, if he were a visual learner, if he couldn't, you know, process quickly enough on the test, but he's a visual learner, we'll teach him with tape. We're not going to reject a player because he's got a learning disability or a learning anomaly of some kind. It's, it's just, it's become a political football, very honestly. Yeah, because none of us know what it is, Bill. And no, none of us use, know what it's used for. Yeah, well, that's what it's used for. It's a diagnostic tool. Wow, that is really something. You know, everybody learns in a different way. Right. You know, in, in our day, Bill, when we played, there was we were all on 16 millimeter film. And, um, you know, you didn't get the film back if you take practice till even the next day or two days after. Right. Uh, it's not like the tape now that by the time the coaches hit their offices, the tape of the morning practice is right there. But my coach would be telling me continually, Gene, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing that. But when I saw it on tape, boy, then it really 
it really dawned on me. So yeah. I, I learned by watching tape. That, that's how I learned a lot. And different people learn in different ways. Yes, absolutely. And that's all the Wondovic is used for, to diagnose if there are learning dif difficulties. And by the way, on a 50-question 50, 50 test, if someone got 33 or 34 right out of 50, that's that's an off-the-charts score. It's an off-the-charts score. Okay. Has anybody ever gotten them all right? No. No one's ever had. Not to no my one's own. ever gotten a perfect score. Not to my knowledge. Bill, you've also mentioned in the past that GMs and coaches enjoy having a meeting with players. Now, are you allowed to meet with every player that you are interested in, or how, how does that work? Uh, no, you're not allowed to because they simply don't have the time to do it. Uh, you're allowed to pick 60 players that you can interview over the two days. And those interviews take place at night. They're 20 minutes in length. Uh, they're just getting to know you kind of meetings. Uh, as we as we got more into it in Indianapolis uh, and, and, and discern, try to discern the value we got from those meetings, it became clear to me and to Coach Dungy that we weren't psychologists. We couldn't glean anything from a 20 minute meeting. We were just wasting our time and the players time. So what we would do, we had our, our psychologists conduct that meeting. We sat there as spectators and listened to her <clears throat> and then listened to her evaluation. And many times she would ask for the scout to test the player in advance at a school or at the senior bowl or at the East West game so that she would have a, a little bit of a foreknowledge of that player and then be able to ask specific questions and then give us a readout at the appropriate time. And she would always give us kind of a ballpark after the, after the, uh, the meeting. Other teams want the coach, you know, to look the player in the eye. They want him to be on the blackboard, all of that kind of stuff. It, whatever, whatever floats their boat is fine. But those meetings are 20 minutes in length. Uh, there's a great story of Peyton Manning. Uh, Ryan Leaf and Peyton Manning were the two top quarterbacks in the draft in 1998. And when you they, had the first, you had first pick, correct? And the Colts had the first pick. That's right. Yeah. So, first night, Ryan Leaf's, Ryan Leaf's group is there, and he's scheduled to meet with us, and he blows us off. He doesn't show up. So uh, we're we're dumbfounded. That never happened before. Uh, I call his agent, Lee Steinberg. I can't get him. Finally, get a call back very late at night. And he says, well, uh, you gave us the wrong time. I said, no, we didn't give you the wrong time. <laughs> so and it, that, that was a testy conversation that, that went on for a while. Testy is probably a charitable word. <laughs> but Steinberg, the, the following day, said, well, the Colts gave us the wrong time. He later, Ryan and Steinberg later admitted, in fact, Ryan, a couple of years ago, I think, that, in fact, he didn't want to come to Indianapolis, and they blew us off deliberately. So, okay, that's fine. We didn't, we were concerned about him. We didn't care about the meeting. You know, we'd get a meeting with him at another time. Uh, and so Peyton comes in and the next night, and uh, he's got a sport coat on, and he's got a yellow legal pad, and he said, would you mind if I asked you guys a few questions? I said, no. That's fine. Go right ahead. And uh, so, you know, he's asking about the offense, about the construct of the offense, and, you know, all hardcore football questions. All of a sudden, beep, the horn blows, ending the meeting. So Peyton gets up and he goes, well, thank you very much. This has been great. I really appreciate it. I, I, I want you to know that, you know, I really would like to be here. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, we, we, we can win championships here. So I said, okay, thank you. And he left the room. We looked at one another. And he said, holy mackerel, he just interviewed us. <laughs> <laughs> Little did we know <laughs> that for the next 14 years, <laughs> that's what the relationship was going to be like. <laughs> he was terrific with feedback. He, he, he was on top of every detail. 
after every year he would come back from the Pro Bowl and he would sit down with me and have a notepad full of about 25 things. Here's what this guy did. Here's what that guy did. Think about whether we can do this, all those kinds of things. So it, it, does, it proves that, you know, as a psychologist say, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, Bill, the combine has been in Indianapolis for years and years. Is there any chance that it'll move? Yes, there is. Uh, the league office has pushed, I would say, pretty forcefully to try to move it around the country the way they do with the draft. But the clubs, frankly, have pushed back because there's no place better equipped to do the physicals than Indianapolis. There was actually discussion about whether or not the physicals ought to be done in Indianapolis, and then the players and coaches and everybody else flown to another site where the television show would take place and the workouts would take place. That has not yet been uh, approved, or and I don't sense any, any degree of excitement about it uh, among the clubs. In fact, just the opposite is true. Uh, they'd like it to remain in Indianapolis because it's centrally located. The facilities are great. The restaurants are there. The hotels are all within walking distance, covered walkways if the weather's bad. So, uh, and St. Elmo's is certainly Elmo. not gonna gonna uh, like the fact that uh, the the combine might move. <laughs> That's right. St. Elmo's is the most famous restaurant in Indianapolis, largely because of the combine. Everybody goes there uh, in the football world. So. Uh, Thus far, there's been no ability, there's been no uh, cities out there bidding for it, saying, you know, we'd like to have it. Um, but um, there, there is a lot of worry among football people that it will either move or bifurcate. And, um, and that would be a shame because it works perfectly. You know, there's the old story, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It works perfectly in Indianapolis. Maybe not perfectly for the television show, but for doing what the combine is designed to do, it works perfectly in the Athens. Well, we're out of time for this week's On the Fly. I want to thank our special guest, Bill Polian. I'm your host, Gene DiFilippo. Thanks for your time this time, and we'll see you next time.